In this episode, you'll hear all about motherwort benefits and get a recipe for motherwort tincture. Here's a clip from the interview. One of the many aspects of motherwort that I really adore is the way that it helps support us when we are feeling anxious or, you know, just our emotional stability is a little bit off and it has benefits with long-term use. But even in the moment, within minutes after taking the tincture, I and and many of my clients will notice this immediate kind of grounding action. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I've long respected Maria's work and herbal offerings, so it was a personal pleasure to have her on the show. For those of you who don't already know her, Maria Noel Groves is a clinical herbalist who runs Wintergreen Botanicals Herbal Education Center and Clinic, nestled in the pine forests of New Hampshire. Her business is devoted to education and empowerment via classes, health consultations, and writing with the foundational belief that good health grows in nature. She's the author of the award-winning best-selling book, Body into Balance, An Herbal Guide to Holistic Self-Care, as well as the book, Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies. Learn more about Maria and herbs at wintergreenbotanicals.com. Welcome to the podcast, Maria. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm so excited to talk about the herb you've chosen. But first, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and and what pulled you into this beautiful herbal world. Yeah, I you know I I was thinking about it. I have like a couple different origin stories when it comes to my you know how I delved into the world of herbs. So I'll I won't share all of them, but I'll share a few that are pertinent. I think um, just you know I didn't grow up in a family that that used herbs, but my mother is a very holistically minded nurse who has a garden and had that Reader's Digest book. Uh, I don't know if any if you or any of your listeners know about this, but it's the Reader's Digest, like Magic of Medicine of Plants. And in my, you know, growing up in the 80s, that was a, a popular book that people had on hand. And I remember looking at it just thinking like, it's so cool that plants have these superpowers. And But we never actually worked with the plants medicinally. It was just more of knowing that such a thing existed and thinking it was neat. And then when I was getting my degree in journalism, I was starting to, with that, delve into herbs a little bit already, just, you know, writing articles about herbs for my classes. And then I had a really stressful uh, set of experiences in college and developed panic attacks and Mm -hmm. insomnia. And I was probably already kind of high, high strung anyway, but that definitely put that into a less desirable state. And that's what got me. I was already interested in herbs, but that's when I decided to walk into an herb shop and say, hey, I need help. What would you recommend for me? And they set me up with kava tincture and valerian tincture, kava for the anxiety support and valerian for the sleep support. And of course, I did a lot of personal work too, which I think is always important. It's usually not just about taking herbs, but the herbs were really, really helpful. And that, you know, at that point, I was pretty hooked. And that dove me in much deeper into herbal medicine. So I ended up doing, you know, getting books and writing a lot of articles about herbs. I became an editor for Natural Health Magazine and covered their herb beat and ran their fact checking department, which gave me a phenomenal opportunity to interview herbalists around the country and get access to like a bunch of herb books for free. And at that time in like year 2000 to 2002, a lot of really great herb books were coming out. And uh, and then when I left the magazine, I decided to study to become an herbalist. So herbs have really taken over the last like 25 plus years of my life in a good way. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 
2007, I launched my business full time, uh, although I was already doing some work prior to that. And then in 2016, Body into Balance came out. And then a few years later, Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies came out. So it's been a, a really awesome journey. Mm. Yeah, it's, we have like similar story in that like, for me, it was um, Prescription for Nutritional Healing was the book that I was like, ooh, like, wow, that's so cool. But it was like kind of a book reference until like I, you know, like it was like a something of interest until it like really became a part of my life. So um, I, I remember that book because I worked while I was in college. I worked uh, and shortly thereafter, I worked in natural food stores and we had Prescription for Nutritional Healing like in the in the the stacks and, and now so many of my first herb books I I no longer own because I don't like them as much quality wise as the ones that I've you know I, I'd say Deb Soul's book was the first good quality herb book mm -hmm. that I had but I I did purchase a few more that were readily available before that. And now there are so many greater books, including Gears, of course. <laughs> well, I was actually going to say, well, 2016 with Body and Balance, there are so many fabulous herb books out there, but that one just really captured so many of our attention and is still, I know, a top recommend for a lot of people when they say, what is that one herb book? Body and Balance is that one because it's it gives people answers that they're seeking for in a really practical, easy to understand way, but within this wonderful holistic framework that is so important. So I just absolutely love Body into Balance. And it really was a, it was this, I don't know, just like, it's like you planted your flag in, in the garden and that one with that, because it just is an iconic book now. And then following it up with Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies, which is such a beautiful book for the garden, which is one of my passions. So yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. been a blessing to have your work out there in the world through books, as well as your other offerings, which I know we'll get to talk to in a bit. Well, when I saw that you wanted to talk about motherwort, I was very excited because this is such a cherished or people who know and love motherwort really know and love motherwort. It's often one that people don't feel like indifferent about. It's it's so beloved. So I'm excited to talk about motherwort with you. What what compelled you to choose motherwort? So yeah, I love motherwort in so many different ways. And it's become super indispensable to me in the apothecary for myself personally, as well as for my clients. And you know, one of the many aspects of motherwort that I really adore is the way that it helps support us when we are feeling anxious or, you know, just our emotional stability is a little bit off. And it has benefits with long-term use, but even in the moment, within minutes after taking the tincture, I and, and many of my clients will notice this immediate kind of grounding action. And this is a really bitter tasting plant. It's not one that is enjoyable from a flavor perspective. So usually I am using it as like a fresh plant tincture as opposed to say a tea, but there's something just very grounding in that bitterness of it, that relaxing quality. And it is also very easy to grow in the garden, which is something that I love because, you know, motherwort is something that many of us can, can cultivate. And sometimes you'll even find it just popping up in the garden, depending upon where you live. And other herbs like kava, they're great, but it doesn't have quite as nice of a safety profile as motherwort, and it's not something that we can easily grow. And so that those are a variety of the reasons why I've really come to love and you know really rely very heavily upon motherwort in my practice and in my in my personal life as well. I love it in the garden so much. It's uh, you know those little leaves are so early to come out and I love to see them. And then it puts up these beautiful stalks with, that are kind of prickly and well, there's the leaves that come off the stalks and then these tiny little mint flowers. And those are some of my favorite colors that kind of pink and pinkish to purplish and sometimes light pink. And I love those so much. And the bees love them. I mean, I could spend so much time watching all kinds of bees from honeybees to bumblebees just the bees love being with those flowers. So you walk by a stand of motherwort and it's like buzzing <laughs> with all the activity there. It's such a delight to have in the garden. Yeah. I The, the pictures of motherwort are one of the first like pictures of plants when I'm doing my intro class on herbs. And we'll talk about how plants have personalities. And on that slide, I have a close up of motherwort's flowers because if anybody hasn't had a chance, like they really should just get up close and personal. They're teeny tiny. You know, as a whole, it doesn't look like a really showy flowery plant, but the flowers themselves are just 
pink and poofy and spotted. And they remind me of like somebody, you know, this fierce um, individual with like a boa and just like this hmm. wonderful presence. And in some ways they look like they are, you know, screaming for attention, but in other ways they, they look so soft and loving. And I think of it as just such a, a tough love plant because you have this bitter flavor, but this really amazing relaxant property. And then you have, you mentioned the spikiness of it. It's, I notice on mine that as it starts to flower and the flowers start to go by, it's the bracts that are yeah, holding the, yeah. the, and the, the, calyxes that are holding the flowers that get kind of sharp and they can even be a little bit splintery if you're harvesting and working with the plant as it's flowering or, you know, as the flowers are starting to go by. But then the early season and the late season when it's more just like green and leafy, it's actually pretty soft and the leaves mm -hmm. are really lush. And then later on, the leaves get really, really small and narrow and dry. And it's just, it's such an interesting plant of dualities in a beautiful way. There's a potter among many other things. Zoe Gardner makes these really great pottery pieces. I don't know that she's doing it these days, but motherwort is one of the leaves that will sometimes get um, imprinted onto the pottery. And the leaves look so different depending upon which ones you pick from which part of the plant at which stage, which I just think is kind of fun. <laughs> that is fun. So with motherwort, I think the fact that it is so bitter is kind of what makes it surprising and how beloved it is. Because we can think like it's it's so easy to love rose. It's so easy to love lavender. These things that smell so nice and have these you know, wonderful sweet tastes or floral tastes to them. But yeah, there's no mistaking motherwort and its bitterness. It is bitter, bitter, bitter. Yes, <laughs> very bitter. So, you know, it probably does have benefits for supporting digestion as well as and probably detoxification too, as many of our bitter plants do. But it does seem like it's so very specific for relaxing the nervous system and grounding the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then also the cardiovascular piece as well, that it seems to help relax any anywhere where stress and anxiety, nervous system stuff is affecting cardiovascular health and sometimes also where cardiovascular health is intertwined with the other. So, um, so for example, if people are having a panic attack that feels like a heart attack, but you know, you know, you want to make sure it's not a heart attack because then you should go to the hospital. It can be really helpful for that sometimes for hypertension, especially when it's associated with, um, when it's associated with being stressed, that that's one of the triggers for somebody and, or when you're stressed and you get that kind of like tight feeling in your chest or a little bit of tachycardia or dysrhythmia, but, but in a benign, you know, benign, benign cardiac scenarios. And uh, I know I'm probably using terms as an herbalist I shouldn't be using because I'm not trying to make disease claims, but these are just some of the ways in which herbs tend to support these body systems. So, so far I'm hearing motherwort for helping with anxiety, soothing the nervous system for cardiovascular health. Um, so kind of painting the picture of somebody who might even have those two tied together, which we often do, anxiety and, and our heart health often go hand in hand. Are there other indications that you commonly reach for motherwort for? Yeah, definitely. So I remember learning from one of my teachers, Rosemary Gladstart, that motherwort was helpful for folks who are mothers and folks who needed a little mothering. And I didn't really know exactly what that meant. <laughs> um, and Michael Moore talked about it being useful for people who are going on sort of emotional rampages, like they've been dealing with stuff for so long. And then finally, they just kind of go on an emotional rampage and they know they're kind of acting out, but that they're just so, you know, kind of getting a little bit of a high from, from expressing this <laughs> and that mother war would kind of bring that down. And so the way that I've sort of taken those two concepts concepts and put them together is to think of folks who are overworked but underappreciated, which often are mothers, but can be, you know, many other folks, other parents, um, as well as, you know, folks who are in their job lives or just, you know, where, whatever relationship that they have with their work or with others, they're just, you know, doing, doing, doing often for others and not getting to have that time for the self-care for themselves. And then they end up having these, you know, emotional roller coasters that they go through. And so I think of, you know, the stereotypical mother screaming at the children because, or the husband, because of the up, umpteenth time they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. But it is such much more, a more broad use plant than that. 
But in that moment, it really does do a nice job evening out that moment of excessive emotions. And then with long-term use, it seems to help even out those emotional roller coasters. But I don't see it as a plant that just like, oh, don't worry about your problems. Just take motherwort and it will all go away. It, it seems to really help support us in a way that we learn how to value ourselves as time goes on with working mm -hmm. with it, that we realize that we need to put that you know, oxygen mask on ourselves before we can go and put it on somebody else in an emergency situation. And so it does seem to be a very paradigm shifting plant immediately as well as with long-term use. And that's just something I really, really adore about the plant. It also does seem to be really helpful for folks who are dealing with hormonal wobbles, that particularly hormonal wobbles that are also affecting their stress, their cardiovascular mm -hmm. system, those kinds of things like so PMS, perimenopause, uh, even hot flashes. I was surprised I had a client working with motherwort for helping with stress and mood and other things. And she was like, oh, you know, the, my hot flashes are so much better. And I was like, really? Like, you know, how's the black cohosh work? And she's like, oh, no, I never took the black cohosh. I'm just, I'm just working with the motherwort. I was like, oh, yeah, I got, that makes sense that it could help with hot flashes too, but I hadn't really made that connection. But it definitely does have a history of use and a tradition of use in helping folks who are dealing with menopause and perimenopause, since that in and of itself does tend to make us have more of racing hard and more anxiety, you know, that's associated with the hot flash itself. We have these like stress hormone surges that go with the, the hot flashes and just in general, when your ovaries are producing less progesterone and estrogen, you're, that creates an environment where stress hormones tend to be a little bit more increased or that you feel the stress of things like cortisol more. So having an herb like motherwort that does seem to support reproductive hormones as well as stress at the same time can be really quite nice. I know Robin Rose Bennett talks quite a bit about working with herbs like mugwort and motherwort to support folks with a wide range of um, gynecological reproductive issues. Yeah, like, um, for example, cramping is one that I think of a lot for motherwort, both in the short term, but more even in the long term, it seems, you know, it's like something taken consistently, people report back that they have less menstrual cramping. Yes, that, you know, and that's one that I have oh, an area that I personally haven't explored with motherwort, which I should because certainly I have had a long history of, of issues with that too, personally, and some of my clients do. But I know other folks I've read, you know, Robin Rose Bennett and other folks talk about that that particular use of it. And there is a bit of research on most of the, the limited clinical research that's been done on various motherwort species has been on mostly Asian species of motherwort helping with hemorrhage, bleeding, um, postpartum, you know, those kinds of scenarios and being really supportive for that, as well as for issues like headaches and just a dissatisfaction in life. And, uh, and I definitely do think of it in my clients who are just, you know, oftentimes they're busy, busy parents trying, you know, they have toddlers, they're trying to work, they're trying to go back to school and they just have lost their joy for life. And motherwort is one of the herbs I consider suggesting alongside the lifestyle piece. Mm -hmm. Now, following that thread, Maria, and harking back to something you said earlier too about how motherwort is an herb that helps us with paradigm shift. And I love how you spoke about that because it's, I would not think of motherwort as a sedative. You know, I'd never describe it as that or as something that's like coming into our bodies and like heavy hammer changing our, you know, chemistry to, you know, do this certain thing, but really is this relationship that people develop with motherwort and how, you know, it comes in signals to our bodies and we in turn react to it. And it is this kind of this relationship and dance that evolves over time and does change us, which is the wondrous beauty of plants, right? <laughs> it's not yes. take this for that necessarily, but this relationship that forms. Yeah, it is so great on that level. And that's one of the things I appreciate about it because oftentimes when I turn to motherwort, it is for folks who are feeling, you know, racy and they're just, you know, anxious, racing, not sleeping, whatever it may be. And it just immediately helps bring them down. But at the same time, it's not 
sedating. It's not really depressant in that way. It doesn't seem to aggravate depression. And in fact, it seems to, I've had clients who have a history of depression who feel much better when motherwort is part of their formulas and even alongside their, their medications, it seems to work a well, at least in my, my client's situations and the medications that they're taking. And, uh, yeah, it just seems to do such a nice job. It doesn't make people sleepy in the middle of the day, which is nice. I remember at herb school, I had a headache. And uh, and so Michael was like, oh, take kava and skullcap. And I don't remember. It was like a whole bunch of herbs that were relaxing. And so I took them and then I came back, you know, a few minutes later, I was like, I need to go home and take a nap. Like I can't function. I can't be in the classroom anymore because I'm just so tired. And so I, I appreciate herbs that can help bring people down a notch without interfering with their ability to be productive in the day because often these overworked, underappreciated people do still need to take care of their kids or be in the workplace and and mm -hmm. do that as well as being in a more balanced state. Mm -hmm. Have you ever used it externally? I haven't. Have you? I haven't, but that's something I just wanted to bring up because even if we haven't, maybe it might spark someone's interest to try working with Mother Wart in that way. I think it was King's American Dispensatory talked about using it on the lower abdomen for delayed menses and uh, menstrual cramping and, and something like that. So um, in that realm of just uterine health. So I think that's, I'm kind of more and more interested in these external applications these days and would love to hear back from someone if they if they try it. It's because we can grow motherwort and it can be so abundant. It grows abundantly. It's a nice one to to use as fomentations or poultices, etc. So very cool. I don't work with herbs topically that often with except for kind of a, a select few that are pretty well known. So that's really neat that motherwort can have that other piece to it. It is internally known as an amenagogue to, to help bring on delayed menses and not recommended during pregnancy for that same reason. But then at the same time, it's interesting how it also has a history of use around heavy periods and cramping, but also bringing on, you know, when you're not having a period to bring that on and then to be utilized post, and there's quite a bit of literature, traditional and scientific around that postpartum hemorrhage and being supportive in that. So it's just interesting. That seems to be this very um, blood affecting or helping it move, but also helping it, helping it not be too stagnant and also not too heavy. Which of course is very reminiscent of yarrow. Um, yes. But I've never, you know, really thought it through and if mother were in that same way, but oh, the brilliance, the plants, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> the plants are oh, amazing. They are. And yeah, so you mentioned that mother word is, well, we both mentioned it is so bitter. And so it's not that you can't have it as a tea. People can drink it as a tea. However, it's often not worked with as a tea because of its just a lot. It's hard to get that much bitterness down, <laughs> that much liquid. Mm -hmm. And so because of that often worked as a tincture. And I'm so glad that you're sharing this tincture recipe with us, which you call the calming relief tincture. Uh, and I love the instructions you give us for that because they are very specific in getting a really potent tincture made, which is something that I feel very passionate about because I'm, I don't know about you, Maria, but sometimes I'm scrolling through social media and I see people who have like, you know, three, I'm just making this up, but like three whole mother wart leaf you know, in a jar with a whole bunch of alcohol. And they're like, look at the tincture I'm making. And <laughs> you're like kind of making like motherwort colored tincture at that point <laughs> versus like something potent. And your recipe is is a, is going to be a, a potent, uh, wonderful tincture. I was going to ask you to tell us about it, but I just kind of told you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, I'll add to that, that, you know, and of course there are many ways to make medicine with plants. So the, the technique that I share in the recipe is from Michael Moore's technique, which is a one to two, um, so one part plant to two parts alcohol and using as high proof alcohol as you have access to. So I use 190 proof sugarcane ethanol, but you can use a high proof vodka or whatever is available. And, uh, and really like I, I love teaching the tincture, the fresh plant tincture, this method, because I feel like I'm doing a magic trick when I'm doing it in front of, I don't, it's the middle of winter, so I don't have access to the plants here. Plus it's mostly a podcast, but I have this like 
big bowl of plant material and I bring out this small jar. I'm like, we're going to chop up all this plant and we're going to fit it in this jar. It doesn't look like it should fit, but it's going to fit. And so we, you know, chop it up and then press, press, press as much as you possibly can and then cover it to the tippity top with alcohol. And you just really want to have that jar packed with herb. And uh, then after about a month or more, you can press it out. I will note that with motherwort, as well as a lot of other mint family and aromatic plants and green plants, you will sometimes notice these like black dots on the leaves when you press it out and people freak out and think that it's mold or something like that. And I don't know the, the chemistry enough to know exactly what they were. I remember Michael Moore saying that they were some type of precipitated pigment, but regardless, it's normal and it's not a concern at all. So um, just FYI, in case anybody decides to do this technique, but it's a great, that's what I do with almost all my fresh plants. And I do have like a, a short video on my blog and I think we'll link to it so that folks can see how, how this technique works. And if you make a different type of tincture, it will probably still have an effect, especially for a plant like motherwort. But oftentimes the effect is much greater. The flavor is much better. You just really notice a greater potency, but you will want to dilute it to take it because especially if you're using 190 or 151 proof alcohol, it's going to burn if you don't dilute it in a little water when you take it. Oh, thank you for those tips and the assurances on, on the, the black spots. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for sharing the Mother Wars Calming Relief Tincture. And for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free recipe card, then you can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. And we will share that link to Maria's blog as well. So you can get even more tips on making the tincture. Awesome. And I'm sure that you could too, if you were somebody who did not want to use um, alcohol, you could, I'm sure that like apple cider vinegar would be a good substitute or possibly glycerin. I haven't made them personally, but they would probably be quite nice. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share about motherwort, Maria? Well, one last thing that I'd like to mention is, you know, a lot of folks wonder about motherwort and the thyroid because it does have a reputation for potentially being helpful in hyperthyroid disease. And then folks are also simultaneously concerned by that, that perhaps motherwort may then be harmful in somebody with hypothyroid, which is a pretty common sect. A lot of my clients, uh, as well as myself, could deal with hypothyroid. And, uh, and really, my personal take on motherwort and kind of what I've come to from talking to other herbalists and reading through the literature is that it can be really supportive for a lot of folks, but I don't necessarily see it for somebody who has hyperthyroid motherwort might help with some of the agitation and cardiac components, but it is usually not sufficient in and of itself for helping to address the hyperthyroid. And hyperthyroid is really challenging and very hit or miss with herbs and potentially lethal if it's not addressed. So mm -hmm. I would not be expecting motherwort to be the quote unquote cure for somebody with hyperthyroid, even though it might be part of a supportive protocol and it may or may not be be enough as part of that. And then when it comes to hypothyroid, I personally really don't see motherwort working as a like thyroid inhibiting agent. And I don't know of any cases. You can always reach out to me if somebody knows of one. I am always interested in having my worldview on a plant changed, but I don't know of any cases where somebody had their thyroid tank after consuming motherwort. And I'm just really not concerned about it. I work with motherwort with a lot of folks who have hypothyroid and I've not seen a problem. Sometimes I combine it with ashwagandha in a tincture blend, which is a little bit thyroid boosting. So maybe there's a buffering action there. I don't know, but I see it more being just really supportive for the nervous system and the cardiovascular system, which tends to be helpful across the board. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I especially appreciate your, your clinical experience that you bring to that as well. Well, Maria, I'd love to hear about any herbal projects you have going on right now. I have all sorts of great herbal projects, but mostly it's about teaching. Since the pandemic, online teaching has really taken the vast majority of my focus. And so I've been doing a lot of live stream classes and courses, mm -hmm. and several have already started and are in the works. However, folks can drop in on individual classes. So if folks go to my website and the class page, they can see what's going on there. And uh, and certainly the, the bigger series will start anew at some point in time in the next year or so. And, uh, and then I've always got my books, of course. And if folks want to keep tabs on what I'm doing, you can sign up for my mailing list on my website. And 
There's just lots of information that I send out about once a month and whenever I'm doing a new class or have something else new and exciting happening, I definitely post that on the newsletter. And so that's wintergreenbotanicals.com. That's my website to get all of that. And there's so much free information. I don't know that, I don't know which one of us, you or I, Rosalie, has like more content on the website, but but like you, I really value being able to provide a lot of free information to the public about herbs. And so uh, not so many herb profiles like you have, but I have a lot of general information and recipes and remedies and articles and things on the learn more tab that you can check out. Well, thank you. I, I have such a great deal of respect for you, Maria. And as we've mentioned before in our conversations, our work is so complementary because we have similar outlooks, but we focus on kind of slightly different things. So they go together so well. And I highly recommend your newsletter because you do have so many great offerings out there and people are going to want to know about. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I am frequently recommending your work as well. And I know most of my students follow you and really love all the work that you do. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, my last question for you is one that I'm asking everybody in season three. And I'm asking this question because I think whether we've been working with plants for two days or for two decades, there's always something new. And so I'm curious, what is new in your neck of the woods? What's something that's been exciting you lately about plants? You know, I was thinking about this earlier because these are the questions that if I get asked out of the blue, I'm always like, I don't know what I have. I'm sure there's something. <laughs> um, but I did come up with a couple of things, probably more than than I should really discuss. And oh, feel, no, let's free, hear. <laughs> feel free to to edit some of these out if you want to. But there are probably three big things that have been sort of fresh and new in my brain that I've been really focused on lately. And one is because I have been, you know, working on and expanding and teaching my advanced program more. I'm just always fascinated with and trying to think about how I can be a better teacher for folks for advanced herbal learning and helping students cultivate their skills to be clinical herbalists or other other forms of, you know, higher level professional herbalists. And so that's been always exciting. And I love learning from other herbalists and watching to see how other herbalists do things and, and also just always trying to think about how can I make this, you know, course even more useful to the students. And, uh, and then another aspect of interest lately, it, it's partly based on my own health, but also on what I've been seeing going on in my own communities around COVID and chronic fatigue and Epstein-Barr and long haul and Lyme disease, which is very common here in the Northeast, is how much similarity there is amongst these kind of like weird chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. And there, I'm sure that there are a lot of complicated components to that. And I have not totally wrapped my own brain around it. So I'm not saying that I have the answers, but I do, I am fascinated with the role that lymphatics and alternatives can have in supporting folks who are dealing with a lot of these sort of weird, complex, chronic issues. And from that, you know, not, I'm not a detox every orifice of your body kind of an herbalist. That just has never really been my goal, but I do feel like these herbs can play a pretty phenomenal supportive role. And so that's been interesting to me and just still learning and seeing literature that's popping up. Um, and then lastly, I, for the last almost a year now, have been dealing with parosmia, which if anybody is not familiar with what that is, um, my husband brought home COVID just before we got vaccinated. And I lost my sense of taste and smell, especially my, really my loss, I lost my sense of taste for only about a week. That's the anosmia when you don't have a sense of taste. And then for a little while I had hyposmia where I had some smell of sense of smell, but it was very subtle. And then starting around May, I started developing the parosmia where things are distorted. So at first it was things like lemon balm and lemon verbena and lemongrass and, and a bunch of other things were rancid smelling and tasting to me, which was really unfortunate because those are some of my favorite herbs and uh, some of my favorite foods. And then in the fall is when the sulfur group really kicked on, which is pretty classic for folks to have issues with, with this problem where, you know, things that are foods that are high in sulfur have, you know, smell like outhouses and rotting things and um, burning tires and all sorts of other unpleasant trees. And so it's gotten a lot better, but that has personally been something that's been, that I have been obsessed with because it's been fascinating to learn about 
the sense of smell, which I had an above average sense of smell before all of this and always appreciated it, but just to learn how the nervous system heals and the multifactorial components of post-COVID parosmia that we're really still learning, it probably also has to do with inflammation and immune response and other things in addition to healing the nerves. And so it's just been really fascinating and, and learning how herbs can potentially support folks as they're working through the healing process of that. So that, that's that been another major, My I'm constantly on the forums and, and reading and learning and everybody around me is sick of hearing what things do or don't smell like on a particular day. <laughs> Are there particular herbs that you've been looking into for this? Yeah. I mean, lion's mane is definitely a fascinating one. Um, I, but I haven't been able to continue working with it right now just because it didn't end up agreeing with me perfectly. Mm -hmm. I probably longer story than needs to be, but I did in the growing season when things were still fresh, I was working quite a bit with sage. And so I would make a sage leaf tea. I think it might've actually been a Robin Rose Bennett tip that I got through the forums, but I was making sage leaf tea and then I would use some of it with salt in a neti pot and then some, the rest of it I would drink without salt. And that really did seem to be very helpful, but I will say I got lax on that once the growing season ended and I no longer mm -hmm. had access to my fresh leaves. And so I go through varying degrees of how involved I am. Um, also, it does seem that inflammation is a major component of it. And so just trying to work with herbs like ginger and turmeric and making them into a, a regular habit in my, my daily routine seems to be helpful as well. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And for all of the wisdom that you've shared today about Mother Ward, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. Awesome. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Maria's recipe for motherwort calming relief tincture. You'll also get access to the complete show notes, including the transcript. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this beloved herb. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists, gardeners, and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.